may not be suitable for all audiences. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Scholars, welcome to another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I am a professional artist and master educator who attempts to provide the best in art historical content. If you like the content, like, share, and especially subscribe, especially if you haven't done so. Thank you. Can you just be normal and regular like everybody else? Just please, 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 please. So one of the impressionist, post-impressionists that we've talked about a few times Paul Gauguin, as you know, because you clicked on the video. Today we're going to dive in and do a 101 on Gauguin, so let's jump right on in. An artist that is kind of difficult to put right into a category is the Impressionist, Post-Impressionist Paul Gauguin. Although he is mostly known for his symbolic influences in post-impressionism, he was also one that exhibited with the impressionists. So to throw him into a specific category is kind of difficult, but today we're going to go ahead and move forward with this 101 on Paul Gauguin. He would begin his life in Peru. His father was a French newspaper editor and took a job in Peru, but had passed away crossing the ocean. He spent many years of his youth being raised by his affluent family in Peru until civil turmoil erupted in 1854 and he was on his way back to his homeland of France. At the age of 14 he was enrolled in a naval preparatory school and then shortly thereafter he would find himself in the French Navy serving in the Merchant Marines. It was during that time that he began to dabble in art. A French businessman and art collector, Gustave Arosa, was a family friend who agreed to oversee the young man after his mother's passing in 1867. Side note, Gustave's youngest daughter, Marguerite Arosa, was first taught to paint and draw by Paul Gauguin after he started living with the family in 1873. She would go on to have a great career as a portrait landscape and genre painter working out of Paris. Welcome to the capital. Paul had done a lot of living in a really short period of time. He had lost both of his parents. He had received quite an inheritance from a grandfather that was in Peru. And he had served his country with the Merchant Marine. So he decided to go into business following the mentorship of Mr. Arosa, and he took up investments in stocks and bonds and things like that. He sold some insurance, but by 1873, he was beginning to paint a little bit more seriously. No longer was it just a hobby. This was business. This was his work. This was his passion. By 1876, he was accepted into the Salon Show in Paris. This was a pretty big deal. But by the early 1880s, he had quit his job and decided to pursue a full-time career out of making art. My love for art is preoccupying me too much for me to be a good employee in the business world where dreamers are of no use. And on the other hand, I have too large a family and a wife incapable of living in poverty. His wife met a glad and he had five children. But the call of the art career was too much for him to ignore, and so he decided that the best thing for him, and maybe the best thing for his family, I don't know, was to leave them to travel and study and make art beginning in 1885. Although he became a professional artist at that time, he generally disliked the academically trained artists because their raw instincts were being replaced with information. 
When he first started out in that professional scene, he decided that he was going to travel and he needed a companion to do so, so he took his oldest son with him, Clovis Gogan, and he became his companion in travels. But Paul was mostly good at taking care of himself, not really taking care of others. For example, during one particularly cold winter storm, Clovis ended up quite sick. They were traveling out in the weather, they had very poor living conditions, and that didn't set very well with him. This was the last time that his wife would allow for him to care for any of the children for any length of time. Side note, although Paul Gauguin had five children with his wife, but he also has five illegitimate children with four different other women due to his extramarital affairs and other things that he had going on on the side as he traveled doing his art thing across the globe. You have got a very, very cheeky brain, and I don't like it. Gauguin grew very restless with European life and wanted to explore the world even more. In 1887, he ventured to the tropics. He, along with fellow artist Charles Laval, sailed to Panama, where they both worked on the Panama Canal before moving on to Martinique in the West Indies. Due to illness and having very little money, Paul decided that he was going to move back to Paris, where he thought that he could sell his paintings of these unique lands that he had painted. In Paris, he began to show at the galleries owned by Adolphe Gaupel, and these were managed by an art dealer by the name of Theo. A friendship began to brew between Theo and Paul, and a conversation began in the early months of 1888. You see, Teo had an older brother that had this vision of an art colony, and he needed a big name to come into this colony and become the director of this, to be able to bring other artists in. And this experiment, this Studio of the South idea, kind of piqued the interest of Paul, and Teo was willing to pay Paul for his time in helping mentor his older brother along. And that didn't hurt the situation either, and so, Paul was convinced to go live with Teo's brother in the southern city of Arles. And from October the 23rd until about December 24th, 1888, Paul Gauguin would become roommates with Teo's older brother, Vincent Van Gogh. You can go back and look at my videos on more information on this, but to put it in a nutshell, this was a very productive but stressful experience for Paul Gauguin. Vincent and I find it absolutely impossible to live peacefully in each other's company. He is a remarkable man of great intelligence, for whom I have great regard and whom I am sorry to leave. However, I repeat, it is essential that I leave. When we look at the paintings of Paul Gauguin in comparison to those of Vincent van Gogh, his surface texture on the painting is very flat. There's not a big buildup of paint where Vincent goes the opposite direction. Just the process of application of paint on the canvas was a conflict for these two. Gauguin's treatment was very much consistent with those styles being very popular at that time. Paul knew that his painting was good, but the originality that he would bring to the table definitely made him distinct during his time. Nay, an influencer! Throughout his career, Paul Gauguin would work in several forms of sculpture. This was largely inspired by the work of the indigenous sorts of people that he had encountered during his travels, but he'd also worked in the ceramic studio of Ernest Chaplet obviously in ceramic clay media, but he also worked quite often in wood. Most of the things that he created sculpturally were very utilitarian. He made canes, bowls, cups, things like that. And perhaps one of his most known ceramic works was his jug in the form of a head self-portrait. As is the case with his works, they are oftentimes inundated with symbolism. The colors are symbolic, subject matter, everything is symbolic in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes it's very difficult to know exactly what those symbols symbolize, but I suppose that's why you come to me. 
For example, one of the symbols that's embedded in this is a symbol of Jean Valjean. This is a character in Victor Hugo's very famous Les Mis, and through this lens, Gauguin is showing himself as the decapitated martyr of art. As we examine the work even further, you can see that he has no ears. Just a year before this, in 1888, he was living with Vincent Van Gogh, who went into a mental institution because of his severed ear. And so this particular work, having no ears at all, is some sort of a bizarre sort of tribute to his time or his friendship with Vincent Van Gogh. And within the work itself, we see this bit of abstraction, this simplified quality is leaning from the other cultural experiences that he'd had prior to his time with Mr. Vincent Van Gogh. Art is an abstraction. Extract from nature while dreaming before it, and concentrate more on creating than on the final result. You talk about ancient beauty and classical forms. But if you ask me, you wouldn't recognize real beauty if it was outside in the parking lot waiting to give you hepatitis. Within Paul Gauguin's paintings, we can see the symbolic style over and over and over again. We can examine many of Paul Gauguin's paintings and find these sorts of things, but let's focus in on one of his more popular paintings, The Yellow Christ. The landscape itself is not an authentically holy place, but an area in Brittany, France. Now, why in the world would there be a crucifixion scene in Brittany, France? That doesn't make any historical sense. The clothing of the women is not very period to a crucifixion scene. What is going on here? If one just simply looks at the painting, it can be very difficult to understand, but here we go. The element that really drove Paul Gauguin to paint this particular work was not at all about religion. It was about his admiration for the women of Brittany and their faith. In his view, Christ's suffering is explained to them through their visions of this very strong-minded faith that they had in what had occurred. So, therefore, this representation of their visions is what's laid out on the canvas. He loved this region of France. There was a church that was very close to this where he had created a very large wooden crucifix that almost identically resembles the crucifixion in the painting. And this would not be the last time that Paul Gauguin depicts an image of Jesus and in a strange sort of ego thing that he had going on, he makes Jesus look a whole lot like himself. And one of the most over-the-top components of this is the yellow. It's right there in the middle, this yellow crucifixion scene. And why would he paint this crucifixion in the yellow? It was the favorite color to his one-time roommate, Vincent Van Gogh. And so he puts it into this. But again, this is not unique to what Paul Gauguin does in his paintings. He does this over and over again, and we can see many examples of him putting these symbols into his paintings. Your new priority is to find the man who's making these and shut him down for good. Soon after the fallout with Vincent Van Gogh and that whole mess took place, Paul Gauguin and George Seurat would develop into the young leaders of the avant-garde art scene. Paul had this belief that his civilization and the art that was being produced was in a decline. He had participated in a couple of the Impressionist exhibitions, and so he was very much in favor with what the Impressionists were doing, but most of the art world was going in a slightly different direction. There was some conflict on what good art was supposed to look like, and so Paul needed out. In 1891, he set out for Tonkin, which is Vietnam, but ended up in Tahiti. 
eventually he would move in with a 13 year old native girl who would become his model his muse his lover and this bizarre sort of pedophile situation was able just to happen without a whole lot of feathers being ruffled about it but in the end he was low on money and he was at the point where he had to resort to painting on sacks in order to make his paintings and again this is a bit of a broken record the lack of money and some illness landed him in the hospital he was coughing up blood it was a horrible situation so Paul decided he needed to return to Paris in 1893 with some 60 paintings that he had created once he got back to Paris he got a job at this informal art academy where he was teaching and making a little bit of money but would continue to roam around France bragging about his adventures his love affairs his pedophilia and toting around a pet monkey to brag about his world of adventure or whatever the hell it was in 1895 he was diagnosed with syphilis now this was an untreatable uncurable sexually transmitted disease that he had contracted through one of his flings on the road and he had spread throughout Europe spread to these teenage girls in Tahiti who knows where it all went from there but he felt like he was going to be more productive in Tahiti than he was in Europe, so he saved up a little bit of money, got some things together, and was planning to go back. And around this time, the art dealer, Ambrose Villard, had gave him kind of the deal of a lifetime, so to speak. He offered Gauguin an exchange. He would take on a minimum of 25 paintings, drawings, and other artworks in exchange for three hundred francs a month plus he would provide all of the art materials that he would need to be constantly productive and this allowed for him to go back to Tahiti where he found that his teenage wife had been remarried without the support of his so-called child bride he needed to move on so he went on to the Marquesas Islands in September of 1901 there he found the company of two teenage girls, one of which gave birth to his youngest child, and he had scraped some money together to buy some land. He built this little hut where the beams on the interior of it were carved. These support timbers were pretty exquisite despite the fact that the person living there and the artist creating it was shameful. The people living there at the Marquesas Islands felt the exact same way that I feel. They were disturbed by the fact that this old man was having a relationship with these teenage girls. Community leaders went and expressed this to him. They were tired of his ideas. They were tired of his big mouth. He was accused of liable and even accused of inciting anarchy. He was trying to get them to rise up against the government. That's a big no-no. And so he was sentenced to three months in prison. Before he could go to prison, he had appealed and he had done everything he could to argue his case, but the stress of all of it was way too much for him to take. He was living in poverty. The climate had aggravated his eczema and syphilis, damaged skin, and he was in discomfort. He was in pain. He was in trouble with the law. He was in trouble with the government. He was in trouble with the community. And all of these factors were not real good on his health, and he ended up dying at the age of 55 of heart failure. So, what? In our world today, there are many people that want to have Paul Gauguin canceled from our culture. His artwork was great, but his pedophilia and all of the bad things he did to women and others and minorities and the horribleness is just too much to excuse for some people. However, I would argue that we all are guilty of doing one thing or another that's not too great. I don't believe that any of these actions are inexcusable. What Paul Gauguin did with these young girls was nothing but wrong. And so to say we're no longer going to talk about Paul Gauguin in schools, we're no longer going to show his artwork in museums, we're no longer going to have him be recognized for the cultural influence that he created because of these other things that he did that, again, are completely inexcusable. As people, we all do things that are great. 
and the good guy isn't always perfect and the bad guy isn't always bad and if at all possible we need to try to separate the person from the product we need to move forward we need to learn from the mistakes of prior generations not just simply condemn them for what they did but learn from their mistakes and move forward with a more clear vision of what it is to be a good human being in the world and how do we go forward with morality and influence the world in a more positive way and hopefully when we go into those museums and those spaces and see his artwork it's not an instant guilty verdict on Gogan for being a horrible person, but we can appreciate his art for what it was, despite the fact that he was very much a flawed human being, like I believe we all are. Scholars, I hope you enjoy that as much as I love being able to bring it to you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. You have a good day. Please take me off this chat.